Let us move into a Tonglen practice. And today, if you can, choose someone challenging that you're going to work with. St a complicated relationship, perhaps. Um, maybe not the worst person, but someone in your life at the moment that is uh, a little bit agitating, <laughs> a little bit difficult, but confusing perhaps. So I'm sure we all have that person in our life. Imagining yourself as a beautiful angel of light with a diamond in the rose at your heart center. The rose is the symbol of your loving kindness, your compassion for all beings and yourself. And the diamond is a symbol of your wisdom that you create your own reality through your karma. And your body is now hollow and radiant like a rainbow. It is the color blue. It still has form. But you no longer are flesh and bone and blood and liquid, but an eternal radiant being. We think of that person this morning and we go to them and in the traditional text they say that they cannot see us but we are in their space. And as we gaze at them, whatever feelings or emotions that you feel, we realize that we are all love and all wisdom. And we surpass any temporary clouds of emotion. And as we gaze at this being, we recognize their pain in the form of a thick black smoke inside of their body. This pain could be their mental pain, their emotional pain, their physical pain. And as we gaze at this pain, this black smoky substance starts to move towards their heart center. And as it starts to move, we connect with our breath, with our inhalation through the nostrils. And with every breath in, we start to pull that pain out of them. It moves up to their nostrils and slowly escapes them and makes its way to us, forming a mass in front of our face. Now we have taken all their pain from them. And as an angel of blue light with the diamond and the rose at their heart, we decide that we will destroy their pain and destroy any difficulty between us. So when I say now, we are, we'll imagine breathing in through the left it will travel to the diamond directly, and as it hits the diamond, there will be an explosion of light. So exhale, nice and long. Inhaling, 
imagine coming through the left nostril, striking the diamond in the rose, beautiful bright white flash, and breathe out. If there's anything left over, breathe in again. And release. And what is left is just pure light of healing and love. All their pain is destroyed. They are feeling so light and so happy and so free. They are at peace. They feel safe. They are healthy. Dissolving the image of them. Slowly your body dissolves into the rose. And then the rose slowly dissolves into the diamond. And the diamond then dissolves into clear space. Taking in a deep breath and release. And when you're ready, you can open your eyes. Okay, maybe that was a little bit more difficult. Um, I find some of the most challenging relationships that I've had in my life. Um, I've worked through my anger, my hatred, and come to a place of forgiveness just by doing this practice. Um, so it's brave. It's very brave to be able to do it, especially with someone that challenges you, someone that pushes your buttons, someone that you have a lot of resentment towards. But actually, it's the only thing. Forgiveness on its own doesn't work. You have to practice forgiveness. You know, it's like gratitude on its own doesn't work. You have to practice gratitude, right? Mindfulness on its own doesn't work. You have to practice mindfulness. <laughs> a lot of people don't get this, you know. Mm, how do we forgive? Well, you, you've got to forgive every day. You've got to do your practice every day and forgive every day. Every day until we actually feel the lightness and that they no longer take up space in our mind in a, in a hurtful and harmful way. And then you know the practice has worked. <laughs> um, let's see, what are we doing today? We've been reciting mantras, Om Mani Padme Hum. Okay, have you all got some beads? I've got this one I just bought at the shops. There's a lovely little shop in Stone, uh, Stone Ridge, and they sell nice beads there. I know Keg's not too far from where you stay. Um, you can buy them pretty much anywhere, or you can buy yourself mala beads, the traditional ones, 108. And just recite or mani padme hung wherever you are to yourself. If you want to like be um, flamboyant, you can say it out loud. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, it's a blessing. If you have animals uh, and you recite it around your animals, it's also very good for them um, because it plants a seed of hearing the mantra, which can connect them to the mantra in a future life, which is very good. And um, the mantra itself has six different layers to it as well. Okay, so it's, it not only does it mean 
the diamond is in the flower or the diamond is in the lotus, we've used the red rose meditation. I think it's uh, appropriate for the Western mind, but for the Eastern mind, they would rather use a lotus flower. And that's what the meaning is. The diamond is in the lotus. And the lotus is very symbolic, but it grows out of the mud, the suffering of life. And uh, if we are going through intense suffering, we can think, oh, well, um, this is going to expand my compassion for other people that have been in a similar situation. You know, so you start to think in a loving, kind way for others that are that are also going through something that you are going through. And then it's not just your suffering, which is really good psychologically, because then you feel that you are not alone. You know, often when we when we get into a a yucky space, we think, oh, it's poor me, I'm alone in this. But to realize that there are millions of people, if not billions, that have been in the same place and are dealing with the same things. And then a feeling of compassion can can grow. Um, yeah. So the mantra Om, Ma, Ni, Pad, Me, Hung is a six-syllable mantra. And Om uh, means, well, if you want to work on a different practice using the mantra, you are purifying six different um, afflictions. So Om purifies ego, and ego is the realm of the gods, okay, the god realms. The, the gods are very ego egotistic. So they say if you have a lot of ego, you can imagine like a Donald Trump type ego or whatever, uh, a person like that could be reborn in a god realm. Or even on this earth, they are like gods, really. Uh, god realms, I often think of god realms like these characters in the Marvel movies or DC movies, you know, uh, like Thor and, and Odin and, I don't know, Freya and Valhalla, you know, all, all of these, or, or even gods in many other traditions or cultures where they fight against each other, where they're jealous, where they get upset, you know, they have... They have afflictions. So if you hear stories of gods that have afflictions, it, it could be that they are still within the samsaric realm because Buddhas don't argue, Buddhas don't have arguments, fights, etc. So Om is purifying ego. And then Om Ma, Ma is purifying um, jealousy. Jealousy. Uh, and jealousy is the realm, is associated with the demigod realm, which is just below the god realm. And these gods always want what the gods have. They're very jealous of what the gods have. They're also incredibly beautiful, strong beings that live for thousand years. Um, but their, their main affliction is they want what the gods have. And they can never beat the gods. They try and make war on the gods, but they can never win. Um, Oma, Ni. Now, these realms we've all been born in, okay? Don't think that these realms are alien to you. You've, you've all been gods. You've all been demigods at some stage of your existence. We've been everything, right? Um, or my ni, ni is a, a, syllable, a sound syllable that can purify desire. When we say desire, uh, the main human needs, the main human desires. And it's our desire to, for existence that we are born into the human realm, okay? So, or my knee is a purifier for desire. Um, my knee, pad, pad, me, pad, is a purifier of uh, ignorance or dullness, which is associated with the animal realm. So we know that our little doggies are not that smart. Uh, you know, they... Uh, they, they, they can't write a thesis or learn the Dharma or have a, have a conversation with you. But they're all heart and they're all loving. But having said that, you know, enlightened beings can manifest also as animals. Enlightened beings, there are Buddhas in the God realms, there are Buddhas in the demigod realms, there are Buddhas in the human realm, there are Buddhas in the animal realm too. So it is possible that your animal could be a Buddha. Uh, on my knee... Ni om ma ni pad me is miserliness, like stinginess, like you don't want to give stuff. 
you want, you're, you're addicted to what you have. And this is the realm of the hungry ghost. It's a very, it's a very low level realm of where a mind stream can exist for a long, long time, like thousands of years. If you get stuck in this realm, is a realm of intense craving. You're never, never satisfied. Um, it can be associated to sort of drug addiction, where you're always looking for the next fix, but it never makes you happy. Um, so, you know, when you hear of haunted houses or uh, ghosts or something like that, that then those beings do exist. And, and, and they do, they can, they say a lot of the time, homes or houses or places are haunted because those beings have such craving or such attachment for that place that they can't let go. And then, Omani Pad Me Hung. Hung is the last one. And this is a purifier for anger and rage. And it is associated with the hell realms. So if we, if we cultivate a lot of anger and rage, uh, when we die, we could be reborn in that realm of arguing, fighting um, all the time. So uh, if we miserly, then we can be reborn in the, or addicted, then we can be reborn in the hungry ghost realm. If we have a lot of desires for existence, human realm, if we are jealous a lot of the time, demigod realm, and if we have a lot of pride, an ego, we can be reborn as a god. Being born as a god is not a good thing, and I know it sounds like fun, but what happens there is we don't generate any good karma, because all we do is burn up lifetimes of good karma. So when you die as a god, you fall directly to the hell realm, because there's no good karma left. So it's kind of like a go straight to jail thing. You know, being a god, it's 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 not going to be great. You, you you're going to be super blissful for like, well, they say a thousand years, or whatever. But then we fall directly into the hell realm. Now, I've ne I've never seen these realms myself. I have had experiences with um, spirits, and ghosts, um, but I can't validate any others. Uh, so we go on we go on uh, on reliance of what the Buddha taught about these realms, because um, the Buddha is like the master physician, a lot of what the, especially when the Buddha speaks of our suffering, like completely diagnosed that one well. Um, and, uh, and the realms, yeah, I, I don't really enjoy teaching about them because, I don't, you know, I, I can't really put it into practice for my own life. All I can do is really purify my ego, my jealousy, my desire, my stinginess, my ignorance, and my anger, you know, so we can use that as om ma ni pat me hum, each syllable to purify. Um, so I, I guess I wanted to ask a little question uh, to everyone today. Um, do, what, what do you think happens when we die? Uh, do you believe in reincarnation or in a loving God that comes and fetches us, or just do we just die and we become worm food? Um, so maybe we can just go around and just briefly share what our overall view is on that. Um, Prashima, can we start with you? <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, so in my belief, there is the state at which you conduct yourself. And that state, when you die, gets evaluated to see, okay, what sort of state will you be in in your next life? Similar to this. And, and then, um, yeah, like an example. And we, there's lots of stories, lots of stories. And where if you're in the Ramayan, you know, Ram's king, and Hanuman, Ram's father, the king, was his father, the king, because of his acts in a previous life, and they give you the stories of his previous life. And so, you know, it depends on that to, to tell you where you're going to go. And there's choices because you either, like, if you kill someone this life, then you get to that next point and there's a decision because then it's, do you want to then, did you enjoy that and you want to continue killing? Or do you want to repent, but 
your partner will be killed. Wow. But you'd be able to change, write a book about it and inspire people. You know, so um, yeah, that's where the choice is. Sometimes you choose to come back to people to teach them things and to learn from them mm-hmm. in my view. So um, yeah, there's a lot of that reincarnation and the karma that plays into that. Wow, thanks Prashima. That's <laughs> interesting. A lot of uh, connection to, yeah, the definitely the Buddhist path and, and the Asian classics wisdom. Uh, Denise, are you with us? What do you think? No, I agree with um, the lady. It's just um, okay. Oh gosh, your connection. We can't hear you. It's breaking up a lot. Can you hear me? Not really. It's quite. Uh, it's not a great connection. Mark, can you hear me? Uh, only briefly. Okay. Hello? Denise, we're going to move on to internet because we, we can't hear you. Internet, what do you think? So, my... It's changed over the times, right? And I think it's because of conditioning and we get told certain things when we go to Sunday school and then we get kind of subjected to different kinds of probably religions and schools of thoughts as we move on and then partners of different views and I guess we quite closed up to like my my children's father used to well he thinks that when we die we just go back to the sun and we just become energy and go back to the sun and I was are you mad in your mind like it mm-hmm. cannot be but I have become more open to that and if I can go on what what I have received and what feels comfortable for me. It may be wacky. I don't know. For me, it feels like we are all part of one original soul who then each have an individual experience because the soul wants to, the the global soul wants to experience have all experiences and diff- there's so many of us that can have these experiences, but it is one big consciousness. Um, it's made me more compassionate with other people that, and I'd, I'm on the path to try and understand this. Um, I have done some plant medicine journeys and what I have received in the the ones that I have been doing in groups, when people go through their stuff and it's especially irritating sometimes, someone will cry or laugh or like out of, you know, I will, I will receive that that is just a facet of myself. That's also presenting itself to me. Can I, can I just accept that it's not a person? It's another facet of myself. Um, and so people who are walking on this earth, us being in relationship with other people as well, is just another facet of us um, that is kind of mirroring almost something in ourselves. Mm-hmm. But where it becomes quite difficult for me to understand is when it like, can enrage me or it can I can become so mad at someone, but yet I always go back to that place of but that is actually me so i don't know what to do i'm on the path of for all of that to to make more sense to me and i don't think it's a thing that you can do with your head so much as that it actually lands in your body but uh, what this is bringing for me is more tolerance towards the world and my environment around me um I am, when you were sharing about the gods and the god realm, I I suddenly just thought to myself, like, so what is this whole thing about archetypes and everybody wants to be a god and a this and a that? It's like there's nothing, you know, like there's actually 
if you just knew that that's really what you do not want to be, why do we want to go and be that? That's whatever. So it's this deep, 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 deep conditioning from the world around what we should believe and what. Yeah, I've been for a, I've been on a path of try not trying of of. Truth revealing itself to me rather than truth seeking. There's a lot of that too, of course, but since I was quite young, um, but to make sense of what sometimes comes is harder. So I just kind of say, okay, this is part of the journey. I don't believe I will work it out before I die, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Thanks, Internet. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. I suppose, you know, the Buddha also said that a lot of wise people would argue about the existence of a God or argue about um, what happens when we die. And he, he just, he said mainly, if you get shot in the eye with an arrow, you, you're not really going to ask who shot the arrow. The first thing you're going to mm. ask is, can you please take the arrow out of my eye, you know? <laughs> so when i talk of the realms you know everyone can a lot of people can say oh i don't know I, uh, this doesn't sit well with me so okay fine but then we'll just come back to purifying our our karmas and our psychological issues which which is something really tangible um and i, I kind of take refuge in that and I, I i like what you said about being open to rather than going seeking let it find you. And I think there's, there's a lot of wisdom in that. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, Kerry, would you like to give us your view? Yeah, I must apologize. I thought I turned my screen off when Andreas phoned me briefly, but evidently I didn't. Um, no I'm sorry, I didn't hear absolutely everything that Antoinette said. Um, so this has been something that's been on my mind a lot lately. Um, I started out, I don't think I'd actually thought about it, um, went through a Christian phase, um, and then I think I went into a belief of there being a soul, and that that soul would be reincarnated, um, and along the way with my exposure to Buddhism, that's been shaky but I haven't really wanted to contemplate on it too much and then since starting these classes um that's become very unsettling ground for me um the idea that um my actions are my continuum rather than being an individual entity I know that I am an individual, um, but I came across a particular example by Tich Nhat Hanh, which sort of turned my thinking. And he said, you know, that when someone passes away, um, we grieve. But if we see a cloud that forms in the sky and it disappears, um, it's not to be grieved because you can find it in your teacup the condensation creates water and it will then manifest again. Um, and so I've been trying to apply that to myself and to let go of the idea of an I, of the fact that carry as a continuum will, you know, go on into the next life, but that I need to, for me at this point anyway, come to terms with the fact that there will be a complete dissolution and that what arises out of that um, will be as a, a, a result of my, my actions. And uh, I can really only have any influence over the ones going forward, if there are any. Um, because I haven't been mindful enough to have had influence previously. I kind of feel as if if I could get to a point of being mindful in every moment, then perhaps at the point of death, I, I would be mindful. And possibly that gives a, 
um, a being the ability to remember their previous lives because they've been blind for all of that long. Um, but yeah, that's that's another whole <laughs> that's another whole thing. Yeah. Mm, thanks, Kerry. Um, yeah, I love Thich Nhat Hanh's analogy of death uh, and and the examples that he uses. And um, I, I also struggle with them um, because it almost sounds yeah like, like you say there's a continuum, but not in the way maybe that we think there will be. Or th th there's the death of the personality called Kerry. But what will be reborn is a result of Kerry's actions. So am I right by saying that? That's what I. That's what I think at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, what What comes to mind are these children that can play these classical pieces on the piano at the age of five and six, out of some memory, you know. Uh, and and I think for me that's so it's an incredible example of reincarnation and so that if we study the Dharma we will then connect with it again or if we if we passionate about a certain thing in our life whether it's beneficial or non beneficial that will come back again because it's what we invest a lot of energy into um, and obviously comic so yeah but thanks Kerry um, Pam what is your view. For me, it's in this life, I think that with my daughter, she proved to me every time I doubted reincarnation, she proved to me and said, hey, I show you. I'll give you an example. She was like two years old and then she changed the light bulb in my house. I almost got a heart attack because the electricity wasn't switched off. She just took it out of the cupboard, went upstairs, took the door out and put it back in. And she did many things like that. And I think she must have been a handyman or something like that, or a handywoman. <laughs> so I thought it must be, she must have this knowledge from somewhere. It is incredible. But it disappeared when she was about seven years old. Then it all went away. Now she doesn't do it anymore. That's why I think there must be something like reincarnation. Thanks, Pam. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, yeah, there's there's obviously there's evidence. We can see it in in kids, and you know, if you look at twins, right? Um, you would think that in the Buddhist sort of view is, if a twin, if if they really came from matter, and yeah. and if they really came from mom and dad, then both, then twins would have the same personality, the same likes the same characteristics but they don't so it does not come from the meeting of the sperm and the egg and the father and the mother you know if it did then they would be identical in every way but they're not so where does the where do those separate personalities come from you know so really interesting yeah and the skills the skill sets denise we're going to give you another try uh to see if your connection is better and yeah, you keep breaking up and that, but it's fine. Um, but you do get identical twins, I think. But not in personality. Yeah, I suppose not in personality. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right there in that. Not in personality in that. Um, but yeah, I'm sure you can get a lot of the traits of this. Because they say one twin can feel what the other ones do. Yeah. In some cases, in some cases. <clears throat> you know, like I've heard of cases where the one twin um, hurts herself and the other one can feel the pain. Yes. But they're not even in the same room in that, you know? Yes, that? yes. Uh, they're very deeply comically connected, but definitely two separate beings. Yeah. And. Let's see, Antoinette is saying. Interesting. Yeah, fascinating. I keep breaking away. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, Antoinette, when my son was two, he was asking what his name was before he was born, before he was Daniel. Yeah, what was your face before 
it was your face or you know i mean these are really interesting questions some people go for past life regression i don't know you know i i i, I all these things i'm very skeptical about but some people say you know some therapists take you back a lot of people say that they were a high princess in egypt and then i like start to think okay maybe maybe that's just new age woo woo uh and then i get very skeptical and doubtful but i i gotta keep an open mind this is my my current path is to not be too critical on everyone's um, view of where we came from and where we're going. The Tibetans say, if you want to know your future lives, look at your current deeds. If you want to know your past lives, look at your current situation. And that's about as far as, uh, as they'll go with that. Um, so you can always correlate, right? You can always correlate. Yeah. Um, Interestingly enough, I have a friend that did die and came back, a guy called Conrad. He had uh, throat cancer. He died on the operating table. And then he said to me that um, when he was dead, flatlining, he, he could see the doctors working on him from the ceiling. And there's a lot of stories of people dying and having that experience. Uh, there's a book by Dr. Moody, very famous life, I think Life After Life it's called, very old book. I think it was written in the 70s. But it, it's also quite a classic where the doctor kept on hearing similar cases of his um, patients or, or other doctors' patients having this near-death experience. And uh, to the point where he even put a little fluffy toy right up high in the ceiling that no one could see from below and he would he would speak to people that had died on the operating table and they said you know i was looking at myself from the ceiling and strangely enough there was a toy up there as well you know <laughs> so that kind of like that really astounded him that they could see that item from the top of the ceiling where you couldn't see it from below um yeah and my friend said he had that experience and he's not a, a bullshitter you know he's a really straight down the line like he's a christian guy um and uh he said to me that um i was with him in that experience and i said i wasn't i was at work at, at that time he said no 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 you were with me everyone was with me all my friends family we were all connected there was no separation so I'm getting that idea like, you know, we're a wave and then we become the ocean. And the ocean is, the wave is separated from the ocean only in concepts. But we're, we're intimately connected as the ocean. So I think that's what he felt. He felt that deep connection to everything, inter interconnection, into be, into R, as Thich Nhat Hanh says. And this feeling of being separated from others is, is illusory. Uh, and that's our human experience in samsara. I think we have a brief glimpse into that ocean-like existence when we die. Um, yeah, and he said he didn't want to come back. He, he, what 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 I'm what I'm grappling with is often when 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 people die their their mother comes or their father comes to help them transition. So I'm battling with the idea that well those beings have reincarnated. Um, how did they come back to help you transition? You see, um, Prashima, you've got some idea on that. Yeah. So, um, in, in, in belief, in culture, um, there's a five-year window after, like, a funeral is only mourned for five years. And a child in a new birth can remember their past for six years. And...
will remember your old life. And when that child sleeps, they can transition back to view their old life. The, the belief goes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, look, I'm, I'm open-minded to this. Any other ideas as to how that's possible? Antoinette? So I've done quite a lot of work with the constellations. I don't know if you guys know what that mm. is, constellation therapy or whatever. And what I am, what I've been fascinating, fascinated with is that we always speak about our ancestors as if they were never us, right? But if you are going to reincarnate as your child's son, that means that you were actually also his grandmother. Does it make sense what I'm trying to say? Mm -hmm. But we never refer back to, okay, so the son now dies and his grandmother comes to fetch him, which it could be that his original soul comes to fetch him. Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like yeah. it's my brain just thinks in pictures and things. And and I was once at a conscious dance and the guy said, think about, because when you think about yourself and you've got a mom and a dad and they've got a mom and a dad and then they've each got a mom and a dad. So it's only a few generations before you've got hundreds of ancestors behind you. Yeah. And what happened in that dance was for me, like something just happened in my mind and it just something just said to me, but how many of those were you? Like there were just these little lights that came on. And I was like, but we, so we, we talk about our ancestors as if they were not us as well, but yet we reincarnate into the soul families. Yeah. So that I find interesting. And, yeah. but that book, those books that you, are you talking about journey of souls? And those are very interesting. No, not them. No, you see, the thing is, I, I think it's, it's it's almost dangerous to latch on to even if people have done dr brian Weiss did um many many reincarnations for people and they used to go back into past lives not into you know this life he used to do hyp hypnosis therapy and they went into past lives and he was like, I don't want to do past lives, but yet all these patients went into past lives and they had similar kind of um, experiences about what happens. When it's, it's okay. And I did actually at one stage, like really hold on to that. And that is how it's going to happen. You're going to go and there's this big video screen and you and your spirit guide and whatever, and everybody's going to... But I think it takes away from your own journey of finding the real truth. Yeah in this life yeah but do you have a clear do you know i mean from the buddhist teachings clearly what happens or do you also wonder about yeah um I, look i mean i there are so many confusing philosophies around today there's so many books by new age authors that seem to confuse everyone tremendously. So I always go back to ancient scripture. I go back mm -hmm. to because the, the Buddha was teaching not just from himself, but from a deeper source, from other Buddhas that came thousands of years before he did and thousands of years before they did. And there, there seems to be a truth and a thread that passes to us now into this day. So I, 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 I kind of there's a lot of costume jewelry. I, I rely on traditional uh, diamonds, uh, scripture. Um, and that's, but I mean, I'm open. Um, so the Buddha just said, you know, we don't, we don't get to choose our next life unless you are, uh, unless you've had the direct perception of emptiness, unless you're an Arya being, a Bodhisattva, like Dalai Lama's, like, you know, I mean, there's so many. We don't know who is a, a, a realized being. Um, and, and you you know, you might be a realized being, but then you would know you are. You know, there wouldn't be a doubt in your mind. If, if, if you know, you would know you've had these experiences. You would remember uh, past lives, etc. 
then such a being can choose where they want to be reborn as a as a tulkup, as a reincarnate. They, it's a conscious death process. I think as um, a mindful. I think Kerry, you were talking about that mindful process, and 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 then then we can choose. But if we are in a, a samsaric being, our karma forces us to take on a body that is in line with our action from a pre from a previous life. So the the Buddhist view is well, if you die, why would you choose to come back as a pedophile? Um, to her children, you know, if you all of a sudden become a conscious being at the time of death and go, I consciously choose to come back and murder eight children in a high school shooting. Like, why would you want to do that? You know, and I know a lot of people say to me, yeah, but you know, your soul has to experience everything in order for the soul journey to make its part. Like the Buddha would not agree with that. And the ancient scripture wisdom would not agree with that. They would say, you know, you, you came back in that incarnation um, due to karma of, of hurting others or killing uh, and not as a conscious choice. You know? and, and God didn't put you there. The universe didn't want you to do that. You know, that it just doesn't... Anyway, so that's the Buddhist view. Um, and I'm, I'm, I have a lot of new friends lately that, that, that believe in the other view, that, that you have to experience everything. But, but, but then there's no liberation ever, because every, to experience everything, where does that stop? You know, so, so I believe that we will eventually be liberated to the point where we won't have to experience everything, and we can choose what we want to experience rather than, you know, have to suffer. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm experiencing depression, and okay, it's fine. This is what I have to experience. But I don't want to keep doing that. You know, I want to. I want to hold on to the idea that I can, I, I, I can be liberated. And 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 the Buddha said, we will be in a place where there will be no more pain, no more depression, no more uh, death and dying and having to choose our next reincarnation, whatever. You know, and and that's what I. That, that to me, that gives me hope. But if I have to think that I'm going to be experiencing everything because that's my soul journey, shit, no. I, I, I really don't want that, thank you very much. Because where does that stop? Where does everything stop? It doesn't, right? You know, in countless universes and galaxies. No. <laughs> so, so I'd like to believe... I'd like to believe what the Buddha said and, and the Buddha being an enlightened being um, rather than, um, what's his name, Neil, Neil Donald Walsh. You know, uh, I, you know, I don't think people will remember Neil Donald Walsh in 2,000 years from now, um, but they remember who the Buddha was. They remember who the Christ was. And the Christ's message and the Buddha's message are very similar, except... We know that Jesus spoke about reincarnation and it was removed from the Christian doctrine uh, shortly after he died. Because it, you know, we, 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 we're aware of that. The, the Jewish people believe in reincarnation. So, I mean, there's ancient traditions uh, tried and tested. So, I, I don't know. I can't say what I know. I just say, look, I've got to go with something that doesn't confuse my mind, because if you get together with a lot of spiritual seekers, there's going to be a lot of debates. And um, I guess at the end of the day, coming back to what can we do today, in, this, in our day today, to sow the seeds of goodness? And, and then from there, to just let go of, uh, of a debate or an argument about what that's going to look like when it all ends. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just sharing with you the Buddhist view. <laughs> yeah. If you want to know something really ironic, um, I have deep gratitude for Neil Donald Welsh because when I picked up his book, he actually, I cannot really remember what I read in his book, but it was just that he almost gave me, it wasn't him because I gave it to myself, the permission 
to trust the truth that I had inside of me versus the truth that the church put on us. So he will, for me, till the day I die, actually be someone who played a mass, uh, magnificent, massive role in my life, just because of that, right, that, you know, and I think that is what we need to sometimes look at is that even we are, I, those other things I don't understand, you know, it's not so much about right and wrong. It's about what changes in you when you come across something that needs to shift you. Um, yeah, <laughs> anyway. yeah. No, I, I, I've been, you know, I credit a lot of teachers that, that have brought me to my current understanding. My, the Buddhist current understanding is, is that they, they talk about this wisdom as being a diamond because... Once, once we really settle on, on the truth for ourselves, nothing can destroy that. There's no question mark. There's like, this makes complete logical sense, and there's no, there's no debate in your mind. You know. So for me, I have no debate in my mind about about karma and and future existence. Um, uh, but if there's a debate in, 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 in other people's minds about uncertainty about their philosophy, then, then I, I, I guess one should work it out for themselves. And, and if Neil Donald Walsh makes 100% certain uh, truth to you, that's, and no debate, then that's great, then that's perfect. Um, and, and because everything is empty, that means that that reality for you is a valid perception. You know, and cannot be denied, cannot be argued, uh, because things are empty. So my truth and your ex-husband's truth or whatever um, is completely valid for that particular being. And if that gets us to a certain spiritual level, then God bless. You know, I I I, I cannot I cannot say. I mean, in the in the Catholic faith, they say you can be a you can sin and carry on, but at the moment of death, you just say I'm so sorry, and then you'll go to heaven. You know, um, and and a lot of people believe that. So I don't. Um, I, I I mean, it would be great. I wish I wish that was true, uh, but I don't particularly think that 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 that's possible. It just sounds too sounds like a cop out. You know, I think we have to be doing the best we can from day to day and not thinking because because you see that that type of thinking then generates wrong view because oh well i'll just do whatever i want to do and then just say sorry right at the end i'll just hurt everyone and i'll just be immoral and i'll be a gangster and kiss the crucifix and i'll go and you know and then i'll say sorry at the time of death you know to me there's certain philosophies that actually contribute to a wrong view which contribute to your personal suffering so I think that, I think the test is is you know to test it deeply, is this idea really serving me? Is it really serving people I love? And that was what I was asking with the, with the Christian faith: is this idea of me saying sorry at the end really serving me, or is it something that I'd like to hold on to because I, it lets me off the hook? Because if that's the case, then I don't need to meditate. I don't need to go to church. I don't need to keep my book. I don't need to practice virtue. Because big, the big, the big daddy in the sky will come rescue me. You know, when I repent properly. So, these, <laughs> you know, the, we have to we have to figure it out, right? It's it's an important question. Because if there is life after death, and if karma does exist, um. And it's going to shape our reality and our future lives. It's a big question. It's, it's a it's a, it's a big it's a big question that we need to look into. So yeah, I, I think it's been great. I, I really enjoyed um, hearing everybody's views, and um, I think it's you know your your it's all valid, right? It's all it's all valid, and all important questions along the path. Yeah. <laughs> okay any other comments or questions before we close I have to get to the funeral uh, but if there's any pressing comments or questions good 
So let's dedicate the goodness of coming together for talking about these important topics um, to the benefit of all beings. May we become enlightened and see the truth directly for ourselves um, so that we may be of benefit to them and help them to dispel confusion and pain. Kewadi kewo kun tsunami eshe zozo shin tsunami eshe lejun we tampa kunia tokwa shu. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you again next Saturday. Take care. Have a wonderful weekend. <laughs> Bye. Bye. -bye.